Hello guys and welcome to this section where we're going to be dealing with the topic of open and also semi-open files. Well, I should say that this section is going to be divided into a few examples where the focus is going to be on open files, a few game examples, and then a you know, couple of game examples where the focus is going to be on using semi-open files, although there may be some games that include both. This topic will once again feature some games by great physician masters of the past, more modern masters like Anatoly Karpov, and, well, less modern masters like uh, Capablanco, both uh, of whom are players whose uh, games we have studied uh, quite extensively throughout this positional chess series, for those of you who have been following that from the beginning. Apart from that, I should comment that I will also be including a couple of positions that I think are quite interesting from my own games. The trade-off always when uh, considering including games by an author, let's say like myself, is that, of course, the standard of the games, the standard of play is much, much lower than the standard of play of these, these great grandmasters of the past. But that's the downside. But the upshot is that having played those games, one is a little bit more intimately acquainted with the key ideas and the thought process. So I'd like to share with you some of my thought processes in a couple of games, and hopefully you will find that the upshot outweighs the downside. Well, that's pretty much it as far as introductions go. I want to show you before we actually get to the games, just so that there's no confusion. I want to show you this position here. And well, of course, I think very few of you will be unaware of what an open file is. If this is something that you're unaware of, I, th I suggest that uh, perhaps this series is going to be too advanced for you. But nevertheless, let's indicate the open files in this position. We can see that there are two. And then, of course, the semi-open file would be right here on the C file and also the B file and the A file. Of course, there are no open files or semi-open files across the F through to the H files, since both sides have a pawn. I've drawn the yellow arrows on the A and the B file uh, moving north, and then the C file moving south. And the reason for this is to point out that typically, the side that does not have the pawn is benefiting from the presence of a semi-open file. And the reason is quite straightforward. Let's imagine that white now, whose rook on the E file is on an open file, transfers over to a semi-open file. Well, now this rook on B1 could at any point in time return to E1 or go elsewhere. But this rook on the other hand on B8 is tied down to the fence of the pawn. And this often happens. And so here we have a point that we should always be aware of, which is that the semi-open file is usually in favor of the side that does not have the pawn, because uh, pieces are able to exert pressure, typically rooks are able to exert pressure on the pawns. And then the other rook, well, it doesn't have as much scope, it's kind of taking a more passive stance, uh, defending the pawn instead. One final, maybe less basic point, that I'd like to say before we move to the games is that, well, some of you will have noticed that here in the starting position, we have two open files and three semi-open files. But of the three semi-open files, we see that white is having one more semi-open file than black. And this is actually a hidden benefit of uh, accepting doubled pawns, or not only doubled pawns, but in fact, accepting gambiting a pawn you get an extra semi-open file. In no small part is the Benko Gambit, a very, very popular opening from the black side, probably one of the most respected black gambits. The Benko Gambit is in fact, in no small part premised on this idea of gaining some semi-open files on the queen side and having a great amount of peace pressure to exert. So you can check that out, guys. If you're curious about uh, incorporating some kind of an opening where you're using semi-open files to your advantage right off the bat. 
Anyway, that's it as far as the introduction goes. So let us move to our first game, which will be a game that uh, will already be familiar to those of you who are following the positional series from the beginning. So in this first game, we're looking at Karpov Unziker from the Olympiad 1974. And, well, we have a typical Rui Lopez position, and we're not going to be looking at the whole game, but we just want to focus on what happens along the A file and how effectively it is utilized by Karpov in defeating Unziker. White begins with the move A4. By the way, those of you who play the Spanish from either side will recognize that this is a very common maneuver, and in fact, one of the age-old pluses that white gets to enjoy in the Spanish. And the reason for this is that if black does nothing after this move A4, we're getting a situation where white will just win a pawn. Let's imagine that black plays H6, then A takes B5. The problem is black is unable to recapture because of the X-ray on this rook on A8. And so black, it's clear, cannot just stand by the sidelines. Now, sometimes black may play moves such as bishop to B7, and this would be perfectly reasonable. But nevertheless, in such cases, sometimes white is able to continue to increase the pressure here with a move such as queen to e2, and sooner or later, black needs to do something about b5. And so therefore, the more common way in which uh, black protects this is a little bit more sturdy than move rook b8. Why is this more sturdy than bishop b7? Well, let's imagine that black plays the move bishop to b7 here, and white does indeed go queen to e2. We see that already there is a threat of capturing twice. The thing is that the bishop only addressed the undefended position of the rook, whereas the move rook to b8 instead in this position not only deals with the problem here along the a-file, but it also serves to support b5. And uh, this is exactly what Unziker did. However, this is one of the things that uh, white leverages in the position. He plays a takes b5, a takes b5. And now suddenly he's got the A file to himself. White now plays B4. And this is a very smart move. It's designed to fix the pawn on B5, which will be a kind of an easier target with moves like Queen E2 and Bishop D3. And also in the future, maybe White will want to go Rook A5. And the pawn will support the Rook. We're now going to fast forward a few moves. Knight went to b7, knight f1, some typical maneuvering. We already examined this game earlier in the series. Bishop e3, rook a8, queen d2, rook f c8, bishop d3, g6, knight g3, bishop f8. And here, what's interesting is that as we can see, black very quickly, having defended the pawn on b5, very quickly decided that since white had chosen to open up the a file, he would once again return to contesting it. And from here on out, over the next few moves, Karpov goes, opts for a plan that leaves him dominating the A-file. And this is, this is what I'd like you to see. White goes rook to a2. This is a clever move. The point is that if rook takes a2, then white will recapture, and black cannot play the move rook a8. And so he now has the A-file to himself. Notice how the battle is for the A file at the moment, which is the only open file in the position. Indeed, it's the only open file in a position that has no semi-open files. Although I should point out that in this position here, there is a constant tension, a constant possibility that white will play b takes c5, which would create a new semi-open file and make the b pawn especially weak. And also the possibility that black will play c takes b4, and after c takes b4, there'll be a new open file along the C file, and that can primarily be used by black, more than likely in the sense that black has already accumulated his two of his heavy pieces along that file. Therefore, we can say that in the queen side, there's quite a lot of tension, because there are many possibilities, and at any point in time, the position can open up. However, Black chooses not to do so, and he plays instead the move pawn to c4, uh, seeking instead, agreeing, shall we say, to keeping the c-file closed, and hoping that by locking up the position a little bit more, even though white is having some um, better situation on the a-file, he is hoping that it's something that he can neutralize and it will be more or less drifting towards the draw. 
However, Karpov now plays the move bishop to b1. And this unusual looking move at first would appear to, well, preserve Karpov's interest of supporting the e4 point and perhaps even controlling a square like a4 down the line if the bishop can return to c2 at some point. And therefore, in other words, the bishop on b1 is going to be considerably more active than the bishop on f1 for now. But on the other hand, it would appear that such a move makes it more difficult for white to continue his dominance of the a file by piling up both rooks there. And so at first sight, it seems like an unusual move. But after black's response queen d8, white shows his idea. He basically wants, wants it all. He plays the move bishop to a7. This is a really clever move. The idea is that after black's next move, in this case knight e8, now he will go bishop to c2. The point is that the bishop on a7 is plugging this a file and allowing white to retreat the bishop to c2, disconnecting the queen and also, of course, the bishop from the defense of this rook temporarily. But the goal being that after black's next move, white went rook e to a1 and now doubled up along the a file. Now, white, having achieved this control along the A-file, you might wonder where exactly the breakthrough is. And this is something very instructional about this game, is that Karpov now left this tension here on the queen side for quite some time and proceeded to try and accumulate some pluses over on the king's side. But what he did is he used this tension here to his advantage because at no point would black be able to resolve that tension. However, white can always choose the right moment to basically remove that bishop from a7 and create threats, right? So a very typical move would be something like bishop to b6, and all of a sudden that knight on c7 is a threat, and if the knight falls, the rook on a8 might fall, etc. That's actually very, very quickly blitz through the next few moves and we'll see visually how this actually unfolds. We see that Karpov takes action over on the king's side. He even plays this move rook a3 followed by rook 1 to a2, hinting at the possibility of setting up the so-called Alakine's gun, where all of the heavy pieces are along one file with the queen behind the rooks. Extremely powerful setup. Now after rook 1a2, king goes to g8, knight g4, king f8. So a bunch of maneuvering here and a lot of progress has taken place here on the king's side. And this is the position where finally, having made as much progress on the king's side as possible, Karpov at the right time releases the tension on the a-file. He plays the move bishop to b6. And this is the best move in the position and it carries a very big threat, which is to capture here on c7. And in the event of rook takes a3, then bishop takes d6 check will be an intermezzo check. And if after bishop takes c7, black simply recaptures with uh, the queen, then this rook here on a8 will actually be hanging because the knight is a key defender. Therefore, Unziker faced with a tough choice between playing the move that he chose in the game, rook a to b8, and once again giving up the a file, or playing rook takes a3, he indeed gave up the a file with the move rook a b8. In case you're curious, rook takes a3 and rook takes a3 would, in a sense, be the same thing, because still the a file would have to be surrendered here, because the move rook to a8, challenging the remaining white rook is not possible. Can you see why? Well, the reason is that white will capture here on a8, knight takes a8, and bishop takes d8, that knight is hanging in the end. Therefore, stuck between a rock and a hard place, Unziker chose to move rook a to b8, bishop takes knight, rook takes c7. Note how queen takes c7 would not be possible, this pawn would fall rook takes c7, and now finally rook a6. And we see white's 
use of that A file at the right moment, invading. Having first established his rooks, this by the way is move 47 that white actually invades with the first of his rooks into the black position. And this is 32 moves after white played A takes B5, forcing A takes B5 and opened up the A file for the first time. So a lot of tension throughout the game, but in the end, a very, very strong threat here. Black plays rook to d7, tries to defend, and now white played knight g4. And there is simply too much pressure here on the king side, which ultimately decides it. But once again, very important to note the connection between the queen side tension on the a-file and the king side maneuvering and how they complemented each other. So with that, we finish our first game and we move on to another game that reminds me a little bit of this game and a much older game. And this is a game played between Capablanca and Trey Ball. So I shall hopefully see you guys there.